the, this debate over which the OAH got drawn into about uh, you know fact and interpretation. That one Senate hearing at that time on the whole Smithsonian controversy, Senator Dianne Feinstein of California uh, remarked that when she studied when she studied history at Stanford, <laughs> historians taught facts. Now, she complained, they were engaged in interpretation. And this was definitely downhill. <laughs> uh, we have Stanford historians here. Uh, is it really true that David Potter and Don Fehrenbach are just presented facts and no interpretation? It's hard to believe. I think that's probably why Richard White was actually brought to Stanford to sort of go back to the old just back to the old, uh, history that Professor that, that Diane Feinstein used to have as a history major there. Um, but and uh, also around that time, I remember a very eager young reporter from Newsweek called me as president of OAH and said, Professor, you know, Professor Foreman, when did historians stop relating facts and start all this business of revising interpretations of the past? And I said, I think it was around the time of Thucydides. <laughs> that, that didn't help that didn't help much because she said, this is true, this is true. She said, well, I wait and I interview him. <laughs> the, um, the convention where I uh, delivered my presidential address was in Atlanta. And some of you will remember the highlight from my uh, memory was the appearance of former President Jimmy Carter, who is, of course, based in Atlanta and also had just published one of his numerous books and wanted to sell them, sell it to historians. And he uh, agreed to appear in a sort of plenary session like this with a thousand, I'm sure, historians, unscripted, just answering questions for an hour about anything. I mean, people just ask him every conceivable question about his own life, about his presidency, about the civil rights era, about all sorts of international affairs, everything. Whatever one thinks about Carter's particular policies and you know, presidency, he was witty, he was articulate, he had a command of the English language. <laughs> there, there was a time, folks, when the President of the United States was actually speaking grammatical English sentences. Um, and he didn't have any, you know, sound bites, he didn't have any advisors with him. It was quite an amazing uh, and candid and interesting um, performance there. I had actually spent part of my presidency in Oxford teaching as a Harmsworth professor, which I think Carl has done and I've had some others, um, which may show you we don't really need a president here because uh, the organization kind of runs itself. Uh, my daughter, Daria, who a few of you know, was then six and insisted she wanted to fly with me to Atlanta to uh, take part of it, to see the, you know, take part in this convention. And, Refused. My wife stayed in England with her, but she didn't take no for an answer. It, she put up little, I, this is another one of my OAH members, she put little signs all around the walls in our house over there um, with little slogans she thought would be persuasive. They weren't always spelled correctly, she was six, but they said things like, am I not free in my own house? <laughs> And, um, and women should have their rights. <laughs> and when I asked her, well, what is going on here, Dari? She said, this is my demonstration. So, but she still didn't come, unfortunately. But back to this question of the OAH, and we have remained now as a institution much more publicly engaged. And I think the president has to be involved in these things now, unfortunately, whether one likes it or not dealing with issues in Washington and Congress and declassification and secrecy and uh, all these kinds of things. Um, but I think the need for historians, all historians, not just officers, to do this is more essential than ever. We, we need the voice of historians in our public life. We, we, as you all know, we live in a world where intellect and expertise tend to be denigrated in favor of ideology and fundamentalism and blind loyalty. Um, back a, a century ago, in his presidential address to an, our other organization,
organization, the AHA, uh, Charles Francis Adams, this is around 1900, that called on historians to engage in public debate. He said, the study of history has a public function and historians have an obligation to contribute to debates in which politicians frequently invoke history with no real understanding or knowledge of it. This is Adams in 1900. The standard of American political discussion is not now so high as not to admit of elevation, <laughs> and invocations of history should not be left to the journalist and the politician. These observations are as relevant today as in 1900, and the OAH still, I think, has an obligation to weigh in and bring some historical perspective to our public life. Thank you.